Welcome to the 84th episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So goddamn paranormal. My name is Jason Knight, host of the show, and joining me this evening is Mr. Oscar Spector, producer extraordinaire. Producing from afar. Producing from afar. Oscar, this is crazy. I cannot see you. I cannot see your lovely eyes. We are oh, sk- I... Skyping this session. Yes, we are, and we actually have to take pauses to make sure that none of us want to say something this time instead of looking for visual clues, right? Cues? Yeah, yeah, because we it's could... It's going to be interesting. We've done it so much uh, yeah. together, these episodes. We can read each other. We know when to stop and let the other talk, and when, you know, mm-hmm. you got something on your mind, I can tell, you know, and vice versa. We can't do that this time. So no. I'm a little nervous, but... You know, we've mentioned so many times in the past that the show must go on. Listeners expect a release every two Mondays, sometime on every second Monday. And this recording, we just couldn't get it together. And uh, Yeah, it involves uh, some weathering that you didn't want me to go through. Yeah, we're getting where I'm at. We're getting wrapped by a huge snowstorm. And we're supposed to get like 10 or 11 inches, between 9 and 11 inches. And... I, I just I didn't want you driving through this could add hours to your commute. So I was looking out for you, man. I know. I, I thank you. I, w- I would have totally done it, even if you hadn't mentioned it. That, like, that would have been fine. But, but I understand. Um, also, the lack of my eyes is, should make you more focused on your fucking job. OK, so <laughs> keep me in shape with me in shape. Yep. But uh, it is beautiful outside. I've been watching the snow. Everything's kind of this muted white over here. And How long has it been snowing there? Since uh, the afternoon, like us? It's been since the afternoon, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's past midnight now, so we probably got already five inches or so. Yeah. And uh, But yeah. It, this isn't a weather podcast. What are we doing? Well, we're doing water cooler conversation. Man, you're like, what about this weather, bro? I do. I don't know. <laughs> you follow those reports yet? No. You know, that's what it is. Yeah. It's okay. We're humanizing ourselves. There you go. And uh, Mr. Dave Black and Mr. Joe Erie are not uh, here for this episode, obviously. Oh, my God. Can you imagine pausing for everyone? Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, well, right, right. This would be a mess if it was everybody on here. Oh, yeah. Uh, A complete cluster fuck, I believe. That's the term. That is the term the kids use, yes. So um, tonight's episode, you know, I kind of did a first. Brought to you by Pepsi. By Pepsi, yeah. Um, I provided you my script for this episode. Usually I just kind of blindside you guys with with topics, and you experience it as the audience experiences it, and you kind right. of chime in and give your thoughts. So this time I provided you the script. Um, yes. What do you think? Interesting topic this evening? Well, okay, There's a, I have a pro and a con for you. Yeah. Uh, the pro is that uh, I realize now, just now, that the reason why it probably works out as well as it does, well, um, you not providing the script to me, is that me, like the listeners, is like the person that thinks of all the questions in the moment, and discovering it for myself in the moment gives a better, honest response. Um, maybe that we're taking grant- for granted for, you know, maybe we're taking it all for granted, the fact that I don't know what you're going to talk about. Uh-huh. Um, so that's like a weird pro I just thought of. Uh, but I did read some of it. The con is that I didn't read the whole thing. Okay. Um, cause, uh, busy and I just kept forgetting to put it up. It's really hard to open this file that you sent me on my phone. If I had, I would have read, I would have oh read the whole God. thing by now. There's 11 so, pages. You can't yeah. see it on the phone. Yeah. I couldn't see if it was a PDF, I could have opened it really easily, but it was like a doc or whatever. And I couldn't get it on my phone. So I had to like go on my computer and shed like a, what am I, like an old person? No. <laughs> so that's why I only read some of it, okay. but it's cool. It's cool so far. Awesome. I'm glad because, you know, for a while, I'm really into it. Um, I love the time period this takes place. I love the people that are involved in this, uh, the research for this episode. So I I have a theory. Oh, you do? Sorry. I was, no, I was going to say, I have a theory why people like us like that time period. How come? But I don't know if it'll, I don't want to spoil. I don't know. I'll wait. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. But, you know, at the end of the day, I thought the topic was really fun. But then again, I say that about all the topics that 
Um, you pretty much are a topic whore. You love everything, right? I do. I, I'm really passionate about this stuff, and it's this is a, a conspiratorial episode, listeners. So you know, if you don't like that, uh, in two more weeks there'll be another episode. Don't worry, another new topic. But uh, I had a lot of fun putting this thing together. I learned a lot. Um, so I'm excited to see what the listeners think. Yes, please let us know what you think, guys. I know that some of you guys do write and stuff, but, you know, I want more of you to do it. Just jump in and do it. Yeah. Don't be lazy. Content. Tell us what you think. Yeah. Which is... Bucks. Right. Stop being lazy. Um, <laughs> which is a nice segue to mention the social accounts, and then we'll get into the topic. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I gave you that opening. Cool. I love it. All right. Well, listeners, support the Supernatural Current Studies podcast by joining our Patreon. You'll receive cool stuff like signed ghostly photos, chat sessions with us, SOS swag, and who knows what else. We've we got a bunch of stuff. <laughs> who knows? We should know. <laughs> well, yeah, it's kind of the whole thing with Patreon, right? They go and they know what they're going to get. Right. Well, we better fucking know. <laughs> better commit to that shit. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Supernatural, a current studies podcast. Patreon.com slash Supernatural, a current studies podcast. Write us up on Facebook at Chicago Ghost Podcast. Facebook's been pretty quiet lately. Contact us there. We're always on Instagram and Twitter at Chicago Ghosts, at Chicago Ghosts on Instagram and Twitter. Our YouTube channel. We got a lot of stuff on YouTube, listeners. Go check it out. Leave us some feedback. YouTube is Supernatural Current Studies. Be sure to like our videos, hit subscribe, and ring the bell so you're notified every time we upload new content. Contact us via email at contact at chicagoghostpodcast.com. Visit our website at, of course, chicagoghostpodcast.com. And call or text anytime Chicago area code 872 529 Zero seven six seven. That's eight seven two five two nine zero seven six seven. Leave us a voicemail. We'll play it on the show. We've had some great voicemails past couple episodes. We don't have a, a new voicemail this time, but uh, maybe next episode we could be listening to you on the podcast. And guys, please leave us some love on iTunes. Those reviews count. You can do it right off your phone. iTunes ratings help listeners like you. Find us, and I want to grow this podcast to be huge. So help us out. Just search Supernatural A Current Studies Podcast on iTunes. And leave us a positive rating. Leave us a message, and we'll read that on the show as well. Can I say something about that? Please. Um, and if you're worried about their listeners, if you want to be exclusive to the zeitgeist of whatever we are doing here, if you want to say, I know those guys before they were big. If they're big, they suck. You know, that kind of feeling. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, please remember the more listeners and audience we get, the bigger we get, the more resources we have to do even better, cooler stuff. We're not going to change. Worry not. We will always be the weird freaks we are. Um, and that your help and support to get us more listeners will only make you cooler by comparison. That's all I'm saying. I love, well said. Where'd that come from? That was great. Uh, I guess I focus better in my room. <laughs> ah. Ah, no. So again, listeners, this is a Skype session. We're kind of doing this for the for the first time. Uh, I think we did it one other time. But if there's any audio imperfections, please forgive us. Oscar's going to try to do his best in post, but just giving you a forewarning. Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot. As far as audio imperfections go, this won't go as bad as others have. So. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like a broken arm. What's that? That's nothing. Murder is what we were worried about. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, what do you say? Let's take a quick break, hear a sponsor, and then we'll get into the show. Uh, if you say so. No, no, uh, no, um, no, whatchamacallit. No people called in this week? No people called in this week. Listeners were really lazy last week, the last two weeks. So we, we got. Well, more. I guess they're, they're all in resolution time, right? They all want to work out and eat healthier, right? The top two resolutions of the year. Ah, well, maybe. Stop beating your wife as a resolution. Don't whatever beat it is. your wife. Do not I, do or it. Or your husband. Oh, don't beat your husband either. Okay. You know what? It it is kind of um, sexist to assume that only wives wife, get which beaten. Which is why I took it back. Which Husbands get beaten too. Don't beat anybody. Yeah, yeah just don't be, beat anybody. How about that? 
<laughs> I think that's a safe resolution too. Like that's doable, right? I I mean, you think it would be easy, but I don't know. What, what, what some people I mean? make it look like it's hard not to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, All right. right then. On that note. Yeah. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible.com, with over 200,000 audio programs to choose from, Audible has you covered. Horror, mystery, true crime, sci-fi, nonfiction, and more. All narrated by A-list celebrities and very unique performers. Go to www.audibletrial.com forward slash SOS radio. That's audibletrial.com forward slash SOS radio and claim your free 30 day trial and free audiobook now. That's audibletrial.com forward slash SOS radio. Welcome back, listeners. Thank you for uh, hearing from our sponsor. Follow the uh, the directions in the commercial and support. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't know what. The I'm sorry. Is. It's so clear that Jay doesn't know which commercial I use. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I'm let's sorry. Just, so let's just to keep clear. Keep rolling, listeners. Check it out. Yeah. Support us. We Next need time you. just say like, <laughs> we need hey guys, make sure, you, make sure you follow that link and you'll get all hooked up. There you like go. That. There you go. Yeah. All right. So, the lights are turned down low. On uh, my end. The drinks are flowing. The ceremonial candle is lit. Let's get on with this show. He means lit the way teenagers say it's lit, not like literally. Lit as fuck. Yep. All right. So I did a lot of research for this episode. Um, from all over the internet, I pulled sources. But a lot of it, the majority of it, majority of it came from a man named Dave McGowan. Dave McGowan. Listeners, if at the end of this episode you found yourself wanting even more, do yourself a favor and look him up. Because he's great. His research is great on this topic. So tonight we're taking a time machine. And going back to look at the time period covering the, covering the early 1960s to about 1975. We're going to be talking about Laurel Canyon. The influential bands that formed there. And the anti-war and hippie countercultures. So not the movie from the 90s? Not the movie from the... That's right. There was a movie. That's right. Starring Kate Beckinsale, if my memory serves. That's right. I'm going to have to... Now, after doing all this, I'm going to watch it. Cause this, oh, no. Don't watch it. It has nothing to do with that. Oh, well, don't, don't scratch that from the record. It's, it's, like a love, it's like a love story. I was just making fun of it. Oh, gotcha. No, this is definitely not a love story. No. So, talking about Laurel Canyon and the influential bands that formed there and the anti-war and hippie countercultures. The Flower Children and their music. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. What the fuck does this have to do with the paranormal? Although I do promise you one ghost story by the end of the show. This episode is all about conspiracy. And man, is it strange. All right. So first, let's talk a little bit about the location where all of this takes place. A beautiful little slice of heaven called Laurel Canyon. Now, Laurel Canyon is a mountainous neighborhood. It's a canyon located in the Hollywood Hills region of the Santa Monica Mountains in the West Hollywood Hills district of Los Angeles, California. In the past, a native tribe called the Tongva held this land until they were decimated by the Spanish and later the American settlers. There's a lot of history here. The soil on top of which our story takes place it's estimated be, to be 12 million to 200 million years old and is a mixture of ocean sediment, volcanic debris, and compressed rock. 
temperature in Laurel Canyon ranges between 64 and 84 degrees in midsummer. Coyotes, mountain lions, and bobcats run through the canyon, while owls, falcons, golden eagles, and green parrots fly overhead. Flora, like chaparral, sage scrub, wild willows, black cottonwood, and white elder coat the canyon landscape. And homes here are beautiful, and they're historic, and they're in the millions of dollars. It sounds like paradise. For over a 100 years, Laurel Canyon and the surrounding area was ground zero for countercultures, even before the hippies and the anti-war guys and all the free loving folk, before the flower power, psychedelic drugs, and of course, the fantastic music. Hollywood was founded by Harvey Wilcox. Wilcox was successful at real estate in Topeka, Kansas. After leaving his wife for a girl 30 years his junior, Wilcox and his wife Ida left Topeka and bought a ranch in Los Angeles. His wife, Ida, a pagan and a rumored witch, named the area Hollywood. Later, Manly P. Hall, famous lecturer, mystic, an author who wrote The Secret Teachings of All Ages, an encyclopedia outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbolic philosophy, would move to the Los Angeles area and begin his lectures on ancient wisdoms and pagan beliefs. Throughout much of its history, the Los Angeles area would be a hotbed of cults and religious movements. This would culminate into something before unseen in Laurel Canyon and likely the world, which would in turn spread to mainstream America and the world and shape the attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs of a generation. Because baby, some of the best music ever created came out of Laurel Canyon during this time. You with me so far, Oscar? Oh, were you talking this entire time? <laughs> I was. Is it a misconnection? Sorry, no, I, I hear you. Okay. You know, one thing I didn't mention, I just want to pause here. Um, one of my best friends, uh, Brian C., we'll call him. You know him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he lives in Sioux City, Iowa. He's one of my brothers, just like you guys in SOS. He helped me uh, put together this episode as well. So uh, I forgot to mention that in the beginning, and I wanted to mention that now. So thank you, Brian. Love you, brother. Hope you like this episode and the way I, I pulled your notes together. So anyway. Yeah, cite your sources, bitch. I know, right? Um, so that that's a bit about Laurel Canyon, where it's located, you know, where it is in California, some of its history. It goes back far, and a lot of its history is seeped in, you know, this sort of mystic, um, uh, culty sort of aura. OK. Yeah. Which which I think plays a big part in tonight's topic. So from the early 1960s to about 1975, all the people who would become megastars in the anti-war movement and the hippie movement flocked to, of all places, Laurel Canyon in California, which, when looking back, was really strange because back then. California was not the epicenter of the music industry like it is today. Back then, places like Nashville, New York, and Detroit, they were where it was at musically, not some relatively desolate canyon in California. It's almost like these guys and girls, these bands, these figures in the counterculture, it's like they were called to Laurel Canyon by someone or something else. To quote Neil Young, who found fame at Laurel Canyon, and who also found himself, like so many others in the 1960s and 70s, heading to Los Angeles and Laurel Canyon for no apparent reason. According to Neil Young, quote, we were just going like lemmings, end quote. They didn't know why. They just knew they had to go. And these bands that formed in Laurel Canyon, the bands that would become world famous, they weren't organically grown. You got to understand this. These guys didn't have the same musical interests. A lot of them actually had no musical talent to speak of. They didn't hang out together or travel together. 
They didn't even grow up together, most of them. A lot of them couldn't even play their instruments, yet they became mega. It's like they were cast into the roles they would later hold. And here's the real kicker. Almost all the bands that came out of Laurel Canyon, the ones singing about peace and love, love your brother, make love, not war, those guys, all of them had military intelligence, high-ranking military involvement, and political ties in their family backgrounds. Actually, a lot of them had what one would consider blue blood lineages, meaning coming from immense wealth and prestige. These hippie anti-war guys. Can you imagine being the one hippie that didn't come from that background? <laughs> <laughs> he gets like he doesn't get invited to lunch as often as the rest. At all, right. like right, you know, it's like school. Okay, that's all I want to say. No, that, that's funny because th that would be the odd man out in this in this group of people. That's how prevalent it was. Yeah, that's so strange, but you know, it kind of makes sense though. I, like right way, just as just as far as you've gone so far in this story, uh, as far as background goes, it kind of makes sense. You know, when you think about people who are brought, like kids who are brought up in highly religious families or structures, right, and they kind of like rebel against it and they do everything in their power, right. Yes, it's kind of like the same frame, right? It's um, it the is. same um, reaction. It is, and that's that's an extremely valid point. That's the point I was thinking about as I was putting this together. I'm like, well, no, this is just teenagers being, you know, teenagers just rebelling. Well, right. I, th I think I have a counterpoint to that, but it's it's in my clothes, so I'm going to save it till then. But that's good. How dare you think about that? That's good. So to to understand the hippie movement, it wasn't always here, listeners, young listeners. There weren't always hippies. They came from somewhere, from a certain place in a certain time. And to understand the hippies, we have to understand a guy named Vito Palikas. Vito Palikas, a hippie pimp, a really strange cat. Now, Vito is credited as being the guy that created the ideas the hairstyles, the dress, the attitudes that became the hippie movement. The hippie movement started, did it, excuse me, the hippie movement didn't start on Haight Ashbury in San Francisco, like so many people claim. It actually started in LA with Vito, the hippie pimp. Now, understand that the hippie movement wasn't yet in existence when these Laurel Canyon bands begin to form. Yet suddenly these bands are getting signed, even though most didn't know how to play. They're being given brand new equipment and instruments. They're being given studio time. Radio stations in L.A. were created to play their music. And while all this is happening, nightclubs like London Fog, The Ambassador, Whiskey A Go Go, and a bunch of others started popping up all over Sunset Strip specifically to support these bands out of Laurel Canyon that no one's ever heard of that didn't really have any musical talent by giving them a place to play. It's like someone in the know knew what was to come. So Vito Palikas, who, by the way, was related by marriage to the Rockefellers, Vito and his crazy Grant dance troupe, made up of mostly underage girls and runaways called the Freakers, and Vito's sidekick, Carl Franzoni, known affectionately as Captain Fuck, they were used, <laughs> yeah, these guys, Vito, the Freakers, and Captain Fuck, they were used to lure people into these new Sunset, Sunset Strip clubs, which had zero bass clientele at the time, and make customers listen to bands no one heard of and that really kind of sucked. Think of the club kids from the 90s in New York. Have these crazy ass people dressing like chickens and angels and intermixed drag queens and all sorts of weird shit. And suddenly customers would flock to the clubs to catch a glimpse of the insane. Same with Vito. People would flock to the new LA clubs to see Vito and his freakers. This ploy also helped hide the fact that the bands playing up on stage at these clubs, these newly formed Laurel Canyon bands, they weren't good. Certainly not as good as the radio made them sound. But the more the people came to see the Freakers, the more acclimated they became to the bands. 
it was like a covert indoctrination. Now, even though Vito was credited as starting the hippie movement, he was a real, it's a real strange, mysterious, shadowy character. Rumor has it that Vito and his wife, Zhu, and that's S-Z-O-U, I think I'm saying it right, and his family of followers were Satanists. Vito and Sue's son, Godot, not infant son at this point. Maybe it's Godot. Godot, maybe? Oh, you might be right, Godot. Maybe. You know what? Because I have seen it in different articles spelled with a T and an O. So I bet you Godot is actually pronounced Godot. Good call. So so Vito and his wife, their, their son, Godot, he was supposed to play <laughs> Lucifer himself in Kenneth Anger's 1974 film, Lucifer Rising. Now, unfortunately, Godot died before he could play Lucifer at or around age three or five. No one's really sure. And his death, poor Godot's death, is surrounded by mystery as well. Some say Godot died in a freak accident, having fallen through a trap door during a strange photo shoot at Beatles' house. What the fuck? Others claim... Oh, wait. Others claim Vito fed the poor child immense amounts of acid, which caused the child to freak out and fall through a trap door. Many people speculated that the death of Godo was actually a ritual sacrifice to Satan. Possibly even more shocking is that immediately after the child's death, Vito and his wife went out to a nightclub to drink, get fucked up, and dance. And they acted aloof, like the child never even existed. Poor Godo. Now, later on, after the child's death, rumors circulated that Vito would pass his own son, Godo, around to his friends, both male and female, and his, f- his friends would pleasure the little boy with their mouths to, as Vito put it, introduce Godo to sensuality. This is the people that gave us hippies, okay? It's fucked up. I mean, related to the Rockefellers, right? By and marriage. related to the Rockefellers by marriage, exactly. Which feels like very substantial to the whole, you know, because there is a lot of, like, truism, right, to Rockefellers. Um, you know, it's their standings with oh, sure. the, the world they created, right? Or the world they, they've helped shape, right? Based yeah. on finance. Yeah, they're and supposed the to be. property they own and Wall Street. The power they yield. Right, they yield a lot of power. They don't, you know, uh, it's like arresting Robert Durst. You know, he's not going to get convicted no matter how many people he kills. Exactly. Um, right, and it's, uh, it feels like this is just a, a gigantic way to get innocent people to, so they can fuck them. It's like a, everything's about sex with these Satanists. It's like. Yes, not these even people. with these high powered people, exactly. Right, it's like, it's always, I mean, I get it. Sex is great, but like, they go to such lengths. They'll start the hippie movement just so they can get like young girls off the bus, attract them with this weird club and people who don't know how to play music. Um, right. Right, it just feels so weird and shady. Yeah, yeah. And don't forget the Rockefellers. They're supposedly, you know, tied into the the deep state, the the Illuminati. You know, right, uh, right. all the, all this comes together. You know, so that's a great point. Now, besides Vito and his troop of freakers luring customers into the new Sunset Strip bars and clubs, you also had the Young Turks drawing people in as well. The Young Turks. These were the new hotness in Hollywood back in the day. Groovy, rebellious, beautiful, young rising stars. We're talking about people like Jack Nicholson, Warren Beatty, Steve McQueen, Dennis Hopper, Sharon Tate, Marlon Brando, Peter and Jane Fonda, and Bruce Dern. And the Young Turks were very much part of the Laurel Canyon scene and were really close to the musicians there. And these guys, the Young Turks, the rebels of Hollywood back in the day, all have deep familial ties to the government and military. Also, blue blood lineage, just like their Laurel Canyon musician friends had deep military ties and blue blood lineages, which we'll see here in a bit. But first, let's take a look at a few of the young Turks. We got Dennis Hopper, the bad boy, the crazy man, back in the day. 
Easy Rider himself. Easy Rider, exactly. Thank you. Easy Rider himself. For decades, Dennis Hopper claimed his father was nothing but a simple farmer. But shortly before his death, Hopper admitted that his father was a career intelligence officer and a member of the OSS during World War II, Office of Strategic Services, a predecessor of today's CIA. Wasn't a farmer at all. We got Bruce Dern. Now, I had to look up Bruce Dern. I couldn't remember who he was. Do you know who he is, Oscar? Oh, yeah. He's from Nebraska. He's done a lot of movies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I recognized him from uh, The Hateful Eight, Tarantino's Hateful Eight. He was General Sandy Smithers. Yeah. Yeah. So that I had to look him up. But now Bruce Dern, again, another bad boy of Hollywood, bad boy of Hollywood back in the day. His godparents were First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. And Adlai Stevenson, Stevenson, who was a two-time Democratic nominee for U.S. president. Uh, yeah, he was a senator. Yes. And, and Bruce Dern's grandfather, George Dern, was former Secretary of War under Roosevelt, which today is called the Secretary of Defense. Bruce Dern's uncle, Archibald McLeish, also served under Roosevelt as the director of the War Department's Office of Facts and Figures, and as the assistant director of the Office of War Information. Good old Archibald was also a skull and bones man over at Yale, class of 1915. Jane and Peter Fonda's father, Hank Fonda, was a decorated U.S. Navy intelligence officer during World War II. What was he decorated with? Like ornaments? Like Christmas ornaments? Like Nah, man, whipped cream. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very nice. Cool. Now, Hank Fonda's third wife was Italian Countess Afedera Franchetti, who was rumored to have had an affair with newly sworn in U.S. President John F. Kennedy, and whose father was a consultant to fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, and was the great-granddaughter of Luis Sarah Rothschild of the Rothschild banking family. Again, Rothschilds, supposed Illuminati and members of the deep state, as if it can't get any stranger, Fonda's ancestors and David Crosby's ancestors, David Crosby from Crosby, Stills, and Nash, we'll talk about them in a few minutes, they go all the way back to the 1650s when Fonda's ancestors left the Netherlands on a ship headed to the New World that was co-owned by Crosby's ancestors. And let's not forget Peter Fonda's hippie peace activist sister, Jane Fonda, when she, in 1972, during the Vietnam War, posed for a photograph with Vietnamese soldiers on an anti-aircraft gun that would have been used to shoot down American planes. America hated Jane Fonda for this photo. And a lot still hate her to this very day, over 40, what, 44 years later? Yeah, I believe that it gave her a really rocky career oh, because oh, yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, if my memory serves right, because uh, I remember that she was like on her way to be a big star, just like Peter. Um, in many ways, to a lot of people, she still is. And that's why it was a big deal when she was in that movie, Jackie Brown, I think. Oh, really? If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Huh. Well, um, yeah, yeah, you're you're right. It soiled her career, and she won the name Hanoi Jane. And I'll leave oh. Yeah, good old Hanoi Jane. That's Jane Fonda. I'll leave a link to a bunch of the Hanoi Jane photos in the show notes. Now I'm not I'm not gonna, you know, joke around. Jane Fonda was hot. Um oh, she, yeah. she looked oh, yeah. good in those those military fatigues in these pictures, but uh it was fucked up what she did. No people never forgave her for it. Young Turks, right? Yeah. Sharon Tate, another young Turk Turk. Sharon Tate, of course, synonymous with the Manson murders. She was the daughter of Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tate, a career U.S. Army intelligence officer. Warren Beatty's father, Ira, was a professor of psychology, rumored to be employed by the intelligence department and involved in the real top secret MKUltra program, which was taking Wait. place in part in American yeah. universities. Wait, Tate, that sounds familiar. Who, who's he? Don't they have an actress in their family? Sharon Tate. Is that the one that got killed by the Manson people? Yes. Yes. Okay. And we're going to get into that, too. Okay, cool. I want to make sure I didn't miss it. That was right in my head. Okay. Cool. Yeah, no, it's cool. And I'm not even going to start on Jack Nicholson. Officially? That guy, that guy was up to shit. Oh, man. We could do a podcast on Jack. Now, officially, 
Jack, he doesn't have a mother. He doesn't have a father. He doesn't have a birth certificate. From his birth in 1937 up until 1954, he officially didn't exist. Today, he only has a certificate of delayed birth, which was issued by the state of New Jersey in 1954. Jack Nicholson has even been linked to the Manson murders. There's a lot more to Nicholson's story, but as I said, that's for another time. So in essence, Vito Palikas and his freakers, along with the Young Turks, were what put these Laurel Canyon bands on the map. People came out to see the Freakers and to possibly rub elbows with the new Hollywood stars, the Young Turks, and as an intended side effect, unbeknownst to the club goers, get acclimated to the new Laurel Canyon scene. So let's finally take a look at that Laurel Canyon crew, the Flower Children, those influential people and bands that supposedly help define a generation and its thoughts, behaviors, and beliefs. And I'd argue that still have echoes of influence today. And let's start with my favorite Laurel Canyonite, Jim Morrison, frontman for The Doors, the legendary rock god, poet, lizard king himself, who was arguably the biggest star to come out of Laurel Canyon. Now, for listeners who don't know, famous Doors songs Break On Through, L.A. Woman, Rolled House Blues, People Are Strange, Crystal Ship, I mean, Peace Frog. Oscar, could you think of any? Uh, I'm not the biggest Morrison fan like you are. Ah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, not that I, I just don't know much. That's okay. No, it's okay. Yeah. Peace, Peace Frog, if you listen to anything, check out Peace Frog. It's awesome. All right, now, Jim Morrison's father was U.S. Navy Admiral George Stephen Morrison, who commanded U.S. warships in Vietnam's Tonkin Gulf in August of 1964, when the USS Maddox allegedly came under attack, which led to the immediate passing of the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which in turn quickly plunged America into the horrible Vietnam War. Over 58,000 American troops were killed in Vietnam. There is much speculation as to whether or not any ships came under attack during the Tonkin Gulf incident. Instead, experts now believe the entire event was fabricated or severely embellished in efforts to fool the American public and push the U.S. into war. So as Admiral George Morrison was helping stage a potentially illegal war that would result in the death of countless U.S. soldiers, his son, Jim, was gearing up to become an icon in the hippie movement. There's even a picture of preppy, clean-cut, almost collegiate-looking Jim Morrison in a sport coat with elbow patches, along with his father, on the bridge of the USS Bonham Richard, one of the ships that was involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident. I'll leave a link to that picture in the show notes. It's really cool to see a young Jim Morrison. And what's strange is just a short time after that picture was taken, We had the Jim Morrison we now know and love today. You have to understand, what's weird about this is Jim Morrison was not an ideal candidate to be the rock star lizard king he was to become. He couldn't play an instrument. He wasn't a musician. Didn't really have interest in music and never learned to read or write music. Yet within a year of his father leaving the Gulf of Tonkin, Jim Morrison completely transformed his image into the troubled, addicted, Sage before his time star we all know and love him as. And I'm not sure if this is relevant or not, but Jim Morrison died on the same day that his father uh, gave a decommissioning speech uh, involving the ship involved in the Gulf of Tonkin, the USS Maddox, the one that was supposedly under attack, which oh, ultimately, really? yeah, which ultimately led us into Vietnam. Yeah, that's not in your notes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so he died on the same day his dad decommissioned the ship. And even Morrison's death is surrounded in mystery. Jim Morrison officially died in Paris on July 3rd, 1971, in a bathtub, in an apartment he and his girlfriend, Pamela Corson, shared together. Morrison was only 27 when he died. Now, even though there wasn't an autopsy, officials basically went on what Pam Corson told them. The official death was heart attack brought on by drug use. But the story of Jim Morrison's death has changed over the years. One story Pam gave police 
had Morrison waking up in the middle of the night, coughing up blood. Then he went to the tub to relax, and that's when he died. Another story has Morrison coming home one night to find his girlfriend Pam sitting next to a table with a bunch of white powder on it. Pam tells Morrison it's cocaine when it's really heroin. Jim snorts it, collapses on the floor. Pam hurriedly gets him into the tub, and that's when he dies. Yet another story has Morrison dying in the bathroom of a Paris nightclub called the Rock and Roll Circus. Then two drug dealers brought his body back to the apartment, and they placed him in the tub as an attempt to revive him. And still other rumors say Morrison never died at all. In these rumors, Morrison didn't die, but changed his look and moved to New York to recite poetry. Or he changed his image and his name and moved to Oregon and opened the Jim Morrison Sanctuary Ranch under his new identity, William Lawyer. Whatever the case, that's Jim, that's Jim Morrison, and we'll see time again this familial military theme throughout the Lowell Canyon crew. But I'll leave you with one more item on Jim Morrison. There is a picture, which has been deemed authentic, of Jim Morrison's ghost standing behind his grave in Paris, wearing dark pants and a white shirt with arms outstretched, just like Morrison would do on stage before going into a twirling fit during instrumental parts of his songs. It's a pretty awesome photo, photo and of course, I'll leave a link to it in the show notes. Um, although I would say, if you want to hide from the spotlight, like as Jim Morrison was, uh, you know, as big as he was, I mean, um, yeah. either folk music or poetry are the two most hidden things you can do. No one will ever notice you if you recite poetry. <laughs> yeah, right. Ever. Yeah. Well, that's one rumor. Poetry in New York. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to another Laurel Canyon night. Famous. Actually, before we do yeah. so, can I say something? Please. I, I want to make a correction on something I said earlier. I mixed up the Fondas, because there's a bunch of Fondas out there. I mixed up Jane Fonda with Bridget Fonda. It was Bridget Fonda who was the, 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 the night, uh, in the movies in the 90s that I thought that was her. It was her, it was her daughter. Oh, gotcha. Um, gotcha. So, correction, there you go. Thank you. In case so you get the emails like, hey, he's talking about the wrong Fonda. <laughs> you guys not know what you're talking about, man. I'm, right. I'm right. going to stop listening. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Have you ever heard of Frank Zappa? The doy. Okay. Frank Zappa, the famous poster uh, where he's sitting on the shitter. Fi Zappa Crappa. Old <laughs> poster one of my uncles had. But yeah, Frank Zappa. Uh, and I'm not a Zappa fan, but I have heard his song Muffin Man. And I like it. It's cool. It's dark. It's heavy. Of course, he's done way more than that. I couldn't tell you what, but uh, check out Muffin Man. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway, Frank Zappa, he was a military kid who spent a lot of his young life on military bases and being educated in military schools. Frank Zappa's father, Francis Zappa, was a chemical warfare engineer, having been stationed at the Inglewood Arsenal, home to America's chemical warfare program, and according to rumor, the Englewood, Ars the Englewood Arsenal was also deeply involved in the MK Ultra program. Later in his career, Francis Zappa worked military intelligence. Go figure. Yeah, go figure. Also, um, he looks like a pedophile. Yeah, he really does. <laughs> he looks <laughs> creepy looking dude. Very, he looks completely untrustworthy. <laughs> Would you leave your kids home with him for a nice uh, evening on the town with Lexi? He, he looks like the uh, no. <laughs> he looks like uh, like the dark version of uh, Weird Al. Oh yeah, if like Weird the Al, dark, ver the like dark if, version's uncle. Yeah, like if Weird Al did a fifteen year prison stint, yeah, and came yeah. out, he'd look like Frank Zappa. <laughs> yeah. Now Frank Zappa himself was seen as the father figure of the Laurel Canyon crowd, having hosted at one time or another almost every would be anti war counterculture movement personality in his home in the middle of Laurel Canyon, which was referred to as the Log Cabin. Zappa even hosted Charles Manson and his family at the Log Cabin for quite some time. Frank Zappa is credited with helping give rise to the hippie counterculture, along with Vito and his crew of freakers, even though Zappa himself did not agree with the hippie anti-war ideology and actually supported U.S. military actions in Southeast Asia. Actually, it's said that Frank Zappa 
held nothing but disdain for the undisciplined lives the hippies promoted. Frank Zappa's manager, his music manager, was a guy named Herb Cohen, a former U.S. Marine with a shady arms smuggling past. And Zappa's wife, Gail, comes from a long line of naval officers. And her father. Related... Sorry. No, go ahead. I keep, I keep forgetting we're not like seeing each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the Cohen thing, that reminds me, isn't there like a famous gangster in LA during this time or was Mickey, like the generation before? Mickey Cohen. And yes, I think Herb Cohen was uh, either Mickey Cohen's son. I think it was Mickey Cohen's son. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds right. Because I remember uh, seeing You're, something or reading point. something about the family doing something with music. And I just good point. Yeah. yeah, Mickey Cohen, huge gangster in L.A. back in the day. Yeah, if you want to watch a good, uh, not not a good Mickey Cohen rendition, but a good like uh, tonal like gangster version of it, uh, L.A. Confidential has uh, like the after effects of Mickey Cohen's rackets. Ah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I heard about the movie for years. I've never seen it. Oh man, it's so good. You should watch it. It's through the cops' angle. Uh, perspective, but it's like the corruption of cops in L.A. As you can imagine, is like really huge. And it's all based on the Mickey Cohen type of mafia. It's like the cops take it for themselves. It's really weird. It's really cool. Huh. You should watch it. I will. Listeners, check it out. I'm going. It's on Netflix. Okay, so getting back to Zappa's wife, Gail, she comes from a long line of naval officers. And her father spent his career working on classified nuclear weapons research for the U.S. Navy. And Gail herself at one time worked as a secretary for the Office of Naval Research and Development. Again, this military background. Gail attended kindergarten with Jim Morrison, and Jim Morrison later attended the same high school as John Phillips and Cass Elliott of the Mamas and the Papas. Small world. They all wind up in Laurel Canyon. Which brings us to the Mamas and the Papas. Songs like California Dreamin', Monday Monday, and Dream a Little Dream of Me. All from Mamas and the Papas. I love California Dreaming. It's one of my favorite songs. Okay, so we got Papa John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas. He was an extremely influential character in the hippie anti-war counterculture uh, that, that came out of Laurel Canyon. You see, Papa John, along with Terry Melcher, who, among other things, was a record producer, the son of actress Doris Day, and one-time associate of Charles Manson. Now, we're going to get into the Manson family murders here in a bit, but i got to pause here because I mentioned that name, Terry Melcher. So I'm going to digress for a moment, listeners, but I think this is important. Terry Melcher met Charles Manson through a mutual friend, Dennis Wilson, one of the Beach Boys. A lot of people don't realize Manson and the Beach Boys, namely Dennis Wilson, were extremely close, extremely close. The long and short Melcher, the record producer, Terry Melcher, told Charles Manson that he was very interested in producing a record for Manson and a documentary about the Manson family. After Manson auditioned for Melcher, Melcher decided Manson wasn't what he was looking for. So the record deal and the documentary was abandoned. Now Manson, already a fucking severely unstable guy, took utmost offense to this dropping of his record and the documentary. So it said that's what caused Manson to plot to kill Terry Melcher. Now, this is important. At the time, Melcher lived at 10050 Celio Drive. Anyone who's up on their Manson history knows that address. That's the address where the Manson murders took place. So Melcher lived there during this time. But supposedly, unbeknownst to Manson, Melcher moved out by the time the Manson murders and Helter Skelter took place. Instead, the home was rented to and occupied by Sharon Tate and her husband, Roman Polanski. Yep. The rest, of course, unfortunately, is history. Okay. Can I give, a, can I give something? Uh, yeah. A bit of background. If you guys are interested... There is this very famous show called You Must Remember This. I don't know if you've heard of it, Jay. You Must Remember po- This. Why, do I, why does it sound familiar? It's, um, it's, uh, it's a podcast um, where oh. it's funny enough, the wife of Ryan Johnson, the guy who did the last Star Wars movie, is the, is the main person there. She does um, classic Hollywood stories on the podcast. She did a oh. 12, 
like an eight part series on Manson and uh, oh. she goes she spends the entire thing on Roman Polanski and the whole Tate thing. Uh, so if you want to find out some nice info about it and really well productions with the music and stuff, I would recommend that if you guys want to listen to it. Awesome. Thank- yeah, I'm going to check it out because I'm writing a Manson episode. I've been writing it for like six oh, months. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You but, have to look it up. Yeah. Yeah, but there's – like you said, this this podcast was eight parts. There's so much yeah. to Charles Manson and the family. And, oh, yeah. And I don't even know what direction to take it. You know what's um, funny? My first thought is that after you said that whole thing earlier about um, how – the musicians were bad at music. It didn't matter, you know, that they were good. Yeah. How bad must Manson have been that he wouldn't even be accepted by them? Dude, I'm going to tell you a story. Yeah. I have Charles Manson on my Spotify list. Yeah. His song, Look at Your Game Girl, I mm-hmm. fucking love it. I Me think too. listeners, Oscar, look up Look at Your Game Girl by Charles Manson. Listen to it. I think it's fantastic. Okay. I feel guilty saying that, but it's great. And no, I, I don't feel guilty. I mean, how many people do we like that did great, you know, stuff? That are terrible things. people. Yeah, good point. Yeah. But yeah, look at the game girl. So, and, and that yeah. kind of in answer to your question, you know, I don't think he was that bad. But as fate would have it, Melcher thought he was bad. So. Yeah, I mean, that could have been a big difference, right? Maybe he wouldn't have. Maybe he would have been a Harvey Weinstein type instead of a murderer, like. <laughs> Right. I don't know. I mean, none of it's good, but just less bad. <laughs> less bad. Right. Right. And, yeah. and poor Sharon Tate. I mean, and I'll, oh, yeah. I'll mention the names of everybody here later, but Sharon she was like Tate, the Helen of Troy of her fucking age. Oh, my God. She I still think Hel, um, I thought I was going to say Helen of Troy. I still yeah. think Sharon Tate is probably one of Hollywood's most beautiful actresses ever. She was yeah, the, stunning. One of the most gorgeous. Yeah. yeah just stunning. Definitely. Listeners. Look up Sharon Tate. Beautiful. Okay, so to get back to the main point here, sorry for the digression, but again, I mentioned Melcher, and there's some important stuff with Melcher. Um, So the main point of of this particular section, Papa John Phillips and Terry Melcher, they created the famed Monterey Pop Festival. And with unprecedented media coverage of the festival – they thrust that that pop music, the Monterey Pop Festival, and its attendees, the hippies, into mainstream America, giving the country its first look into the movement's music, style, and its personalities. Papa John also penned the song, San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear Flowers in Your Hair, which quickly oh. rose, yeah, which quickly rose yeah. to the top of the charts. Now, this song, along with the Pop Music Festival, inspired America's disenfranchised youth, a lot of them runaways, to flock to San Francisco, which created the Haight-Ashbury phenomenon and the famed 1967 Summer of Love. That was all Papa John of the Mamas and the Papas, and to a lesser degree, Terry Melcher. Now, Papa John was the son of a U.S. Marine Corps captain, John Edmund Andrew Phillips, and his mother, Papa John's mother, Edna Gertrude, she claimed to have psychic and telekinetic abilities. Papa John himself was supposed to be military. He was supposed to raise up to go into the military. As a child, he was being groomed for it, having attended elite military prep schools, culminating in an appointment to the prestigious U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. So this guy was destined for big things in the military, but instead, hippie. Now, Papa John's first wife, Susie Adams, was a direct descendant of John Adams, John Adams, our second president of the United States. And Susie's father, Jane Adam, James Adams Jr., was involved in military intelligence and cloak and dagger shit. Susie herself would later work at the Pentagon along Papa, alongside Papa John's sister, Rosie, who worked at the Pentagon for almost 30 years. It's even said that Papa John's mother, worked in government in some unspecified capacity. And keep in mind, his mother, Edna, claimed to have psychic and telekinetic abilities. Maybe she worked in psyops? So Papa John, one of the leading counterculture personalities, has deep ties to the government and the military complex, as does his wife, as do sisters in that family. It's crazy. Oh, and, and good old Papa John, Mamas and the Papas, 
later in life, he had a supposedly huge air quotes around supposedly consensual sexual relationship with his daughter, Mackenzie Phillips. Look that one up for a good time. And this is great, Oscar. Brian, my friend who helped me with this episode, Uh he wrote in the notes right here, I would still bang Mackenzie Phillips silly. That's pretty awesome. Uh (laughs) All right. Now, moving on to another member of the Mamas and the Papas, we have Mama Cass Elliot. Mama Cass, supposedly big hippie, peace, love, was a notorious drug dealer, and her house in Laurel Canyon was famous for its wild, oftentimes violent, drug-fueled sex parties. Mama Cass even had her one of her ex-boyfriends tied to a tree and beaten and sodomized at one of her famous soirees. What the fuck, man? Mama Cass sang California Dreamin', one of my favorite songs. It's not right. Cass Elliot is rumored to have made a pornographic film of herself having a threesome with Warren Beatty and Yul Brenner. Oh and, my god, Yul Brenner. Yeah. And Papa John and Mama Cass had a close relationship with the Manson family. Actually, Mama Cass and John Phillips, Papa John, were subpoenaed for the Charles Manson trial to speak on behalf of Manson. That's how close they were to Charles Manson. It never happened, though, as both Mama Cass and Papa Cass were called off the witness stand. Let's talk about James Taylor. Do you know James Taylor? Or, right? Didn't we sing this in one of the podcasts, Oscar? It sounds familiar, yeah. Um, famous James Taylor song, Fire and Rain, Carolina in My Mind, You've Got a Friend. I really like that song, You've Got a Friend. Now, James Taylor, he spent time at two different mental institutions. One was McLean Psychiatric Hospital and the other Austin Riggs, both in Massachusetts, and both have definitive ties to MK Ultra. After getting out of the institutions, James Taylor sped off to Laurel Canyon. Now, Taylor's father, Isaac, James Taylor's father, Isaac, was the dean of the medical school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Father Isaac descended from a wealthy Scottish family that goes all the way back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the founding of Sudbury, Massachusetts in 1638 or 39. Isaac Taylor was also, now this is nuts, Isaac Taylor was also part of what's called Operation Deep Freeze in Antarctica during 1955 and 56. Now here's a little bit about deep freeze. Before there was an Operation Deep Freeze, there was an Operation High Jump, headed by one Admiral Richard Byrd. The purpose of Operation High Jump was to explore and survey the Earth's poles. Long and short, according to legend, Byrd and his crew encountered hostile UFO craft in Antarctica that could travel, he said, from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Whoa. Military outposts were established to defend Antarctica, which still exists today. And Operation Deep Freeze was established to resupply those outposts. This is what James Taylor's father was involved in. Now, of course, in present time, Antarctica is a hotbed of UFO activity, UFO lore. We're talking underground alien bases, extraterrestrials, and alien aircraft are all supposedly hidden under the ice there. And there are numerous locations in in Antarctica that are strictly off-limits to the public, deemed classified, quote-unquote, for scientific research. Now, let's talk about Stephen Stills and David Crosby of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Famous songs for Crosby, Stills, and Nash. We're we're talking Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, which is a really good song. Our House, and my favorite, Chicago. Do you know know any of those songs? Like Our House, maybe, Oscar? Our House is a very, very... These are the people we're talking about, okay? Yeah. Now, Stephen Stills was a founding member of actually two of Laurel Canyon's most beloved and acclaimed bands. Buffalo Springfield, and of course... Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Stills penned one of the most enduring theme songs of the 60s generation, the Buffalo Springfield hit, For What It's Worth, 
I fucking love this song. There's something happening in here, right? Mm-hmm. What yep. it is ain't exactly clear. Okay. I don't know about you, but when that song's on, that's immediately what I think of uh, when it comes to the 60s and the hippie movement. It's that song right there. Now, Stills followed up the song For What It's Worth with a popular single called Bluebird, which, incidentally, was the original code name for MK Ultra. <laughs> if you read the lyrics to Bluebird, it's about forgotten things, lost love, a woman's sadness, and the color blue. The color blue is used in MK Ultra programming, and I don't know, maybe I'm reaching here, but was still trying to tell us something about the MK Ultra program. Now, Stephen Stills' father, William Stills, spent a lot of time in El Salvador and in Costa Rica, the Panama Canal Zone, and various other parts of Central America, seemingly as a mercenary, helping bring democracy to that region in that unique American way. Stephen Still spent much of his childhood in those areas along with his father. As Stills grew, he, like so many of the Loyal Canyon crew, was educated at military academies. Later in life, Stephen Stills would brag to anyone who would listen that he fought in the Vietnam War and was involved in some shit, which most people... Would brag about it? Yeah, he, he would brag about being in the Vietnam War and that he saw some shit, man, which a lot of people ignore as the rantings of a drugged up hippie because Stills' appearance on the Laurel Canyon scene and his constant involvement in the scene happened as Vietnam kicked off. Stills was there in Laurel Canyon the whole time. But what others claim, and it's probably true, is that the United States had undercover operatives in Vietnam years before the war in the form of CIA and Special Forces personnel. And it could be that Stills was actually telling the truth, having himself been one of those undercover operatives. Now, as far as David Crosby, his father was Major Floyd Delafield Crosby a World War II military intelligence officer who met another man, Captain Claude Andrew Phillips, the the father of Papa John Phillips, during a U.S. military occupation in Haiti in 1927. Hmm, small world. Yeah. Now, David Crosby's real name was David Van Cortlandt Crosby, descendant of three interrelated families, the Van Cortlands, the Van Schulers, and the Van Rensselaers. Going back for almost a century, these three families wield a shit ton of power. We're talking senators, congressmen, judges, governors, mayors, Supreme Court justices, and Civil War generals. There's even a few high-ranking members of the Freemasons in David Crosby's lineage, and he is a direct descendant to Alexander Hamilton, one of our founding fathers. Safe to say, David Crosby is blue blood as fuck. And David Crosby, the hippie, right? Peace, love, man. He loved guns. It was rare if he wasn't packing. And Crosby himself said that he once fired his gun in anger at another human being. Yet he's seen as a star among the flower children, a real peace and love kind of guy. Then we have the birds. Mr. T- you know, the song, Mr. Tambourine Man and Turn, Turn, Turn. For everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? David Crosby also started the birds, so all of the familiar background applies to the birds, too. (laughs) Now, in the beginning, this is one of those bands that sucked. The birds couldn't even play their instruments. In, In the recording studio, they used a team of studio musicians, headed by none other than Phil Spector. And Spectre and his crew of studio musicians were known as the Wrecking Crew. Of course, Phil Spector, Phil Spector was convicted in 2008 of killing actress Lana Clarkson at his mansion. Actually, a bunch of famous Laurel Canyon bands used the Wrecking Crew in the studio. The Monkees, the Mamas and the Papas, the Beach Boys, and a lot of others. Yeah, the Beach Boys, for sure. Yeah. Remember, these people couldn't play, yet they were signed and blew up and all became influential. Come on, man. Then we have America. Probably America's most famous song is A Horse With No Name, which I love. That and Sister Golden Hair. 
maybe Tin Man and Ventura Highway too. I fuck it, I love America. Now all three original members of the band America, Jerry Beckley, Dan Peake, and Dewey Bunnell, all three of their fathers were deeply involved in the military. Beckley's father was the commander of the West Ruslip U.S. Air Force Base near London, and Bunnell and Peake's fathers were Air Force officers that worked under Beckley's father, which is how the three founding members of America first met. They were like all, some sort of like fucking uh, play dates or something. Yeah, they were all at or around this Ruslip Air Force Base over in London. Fucked small world, and they all wound up at Laurel Canyon. Just by chance? No way. All right. Now, which brings us, uh, those are kind of the bands I wanted to touch on, famous influential bands that most people have heard of. And I want to talk about a little further Charles Manson and the family, Manson Family Murders. And as I mentioned, we're going to do an episode on Manson. I've been writing it, and it seems like forever. There's just so much, and I'm not sure what direction to take it. So I mentioned Manson, Manson with Terry Melcher, but let's take a closer look at what happened. Because this all happens in and around Laurel Canyon. In 1967, after getting out of Terminal Island, where he was doing time, Charles Manson tripped over to Berkeley, California, and the Bay Area, and hit the scene there for a while and gathered some followers. Manson and his family then took a magic bus down to Laurel Canyon, where they quickly became entrenched in the Laurel Canyon scene. Manson was the magic man, a soothsayer. Someone who always had drugs and women around him, so he was immediately accepted by the Laurel Canyon crew. At one point, Manson even auditioned for Neil Young. That's how tied in he was. And of course, on August 8th and 9th, 1969, the horrendous Manson murders took place, where Stephen Parent, Sharon Tate, Jay Sebring, Wojtek Frykowski, and Abigail Folger were brutally murdered at 10050 Celio Drive in Benedict Canyon by Manson family members Charles Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, and Patricia Krenwinkel. Those are the Manson family. A lot of people don't realize that the, vict- that the victims of the Manson murders had really close ties to the Laurel Canyon crowd. For example, Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frakowski, they live right across the street from a popular Laurel Canyon gathering spot. Jay Sebring owned a famous hair salon at the mouth of Laurel Canyon, and Papa John Phillips was an investor in Sebring's salon. Sharon Tate was known to regularly hang out at home of Papa John Phillips and Mama Cass Elliott. On the night of the Manson murders, Papa John Phillips and Denny Doherty, the other Papa and the Mamas and the Papas, they were supposed to be at the Tate's house. But something prevented them from visiting, and they wound up narrowly missing the slaughter. And Tex Watson lived in Laurel Canyon for a time and knew the crowd. It's crazy how intertwined the scene is and how much history-changing things and notorious events took place. Then we got the Wonderland murders. This was a movie with Val Kilmer, I believe. Um, uh, what, what was it called? The same thing? Um could have been – I'm drawing a blank right now. It was actually really good. Um, I can't remember. Anyway, two of the most famous murders ever in L.A. were the Manson murders and the Wonderland murders. Now, the Manson murders happened in Benedict Canyon, um, and uh, in Laurel Canyon is where the Wonderland murders took place. They're only six miles apart from one another. Actually, uh, the the – uh, Wonderland murders took place on what's called Lookout Mountain, uh, a road called Lookout Mountain Road right in Laurel Canyon. Now, the victims in the infamous Wonderland murders, the four and the floor murders, as it's sometimes called, these victims, they dealt drugs to people in Laurel Canyon Circle. One of the members of the band Three Dog Night admitted to almost being there the night of the Wonderland murders to buy drugs. He could have been a victim. Okay. So I wanted to mention those two murders because they tie directly into the Laurel Canyon crew. Then we have something in, in Laurel Canyon called Lookout Mountain Laboratories. And this is fun. Now, history tells us that the Lookout Mountain facility was built in 1941 as an anti-aircraft air defense center designed to protect Los Angeles during World War II. 
After the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, people were terrified Japan would launch an attack on U.S. soil, specifically Los Angeles, and for a damn good reason. What a lot of people don't realize is that during the war, Japanese submarines were found off the coast of California, thousands and thousands of miles from their homeland. On Christmas Eve 1941, a Japanese submarine called I-19 launched a torpedo at, but missed, the lumber schooner Barbara Olson as she made her way towards San Diego. On the same day, I-19 torpedoed and hit an American lumber freighter, the Absecora, in the Catalina Channel between Catalina Island and the California mainland. A gaping hole was ripped in the Absecora's hull, but she did not sink, and thankfully no one was killed. Later, in January 1942, a Japanese submarine called I-17 fired heavy artillery on a U.S. oil refinery in Elwood, California, near Santa Barbara. No one was hurt, and damage to the refinery was minimal, but the attack on U.S. soil by a Japanese sub happened nonetheless. Hmm. Yeah. Then, in February 1942, in the wee hours of the morning, radar stations picked up an unidentified object flying 120 miles off the coast of California, just west of Los Angeles, and heading towards land. At 2.15 p- a.m. Pacific time, anti-aircraft ga- batteries were put on green alert, ready to fire, and spotlights were ordered to start sweeping the skies. The unidentified object was tracked to within a few miles of the Los Angeles coast, where it seemingly vanished. Then at 2.21 a.m. Pacific, a blackout was ordered. L.A. went dark, but information centers were flooded with reports from citizens claim, claiming to see enemy planes overhead. Soon after, planes were seen over Long Beach. Then about 25 planes were spotted over Los, Los Angeles, and what was described as a balloon carrying a red flare was seen over Santa Monica. That's when four U.S. anti-aircraft batteries located in Santa Barbara and other coastal defense locations, opened up and 50 caliber machine gun fire lit up the night sky over Los Angeles. All totaled, the battle lasted for over three hours, and around 1,440 anti-aircraft rounds were fired at the mystery objects. Nothing was hit. Nothing was bought down. No enemy bombs dropped. No enemy airplanes shot down, even though thousands of civilian and military personnel claimed to see strange craft in the sky. Hell, had them in their spotlights. What was the shape? I'll get to that. No. (laughs) Local homes and cars were damaged by falling artillery, and a few Los Angeles residents died from heart attacks and car accidents. That was really it. So what the fuck happened? And at the end of World War II, Japan said, in fact, they didn't send planes over L.A. that morning in 1942 during what became known as the Battle of Los Angeles. The official story blames the entire incident on weather balloons and servicemen already on high alert with itchy trigger fingers. To this day, no one's really sure what happened that night. Now you could look this up, photographs from that morning. One famous photo shows 12 spotlights lighting up a huge target a few hundred feet in the air, and it's definitely not a weather balloon. It's a huge disc-shaped object with a bunch of running lights all over it. I'll leave a link to that image in the episode show notes. you got to check it out. And getting back to Lookout Mountain, this is the kind of thing, this Battle of Los Angeles is what Lookout Mountain was designed to look for and prevent. And since Lookout Mountain coordinated Los Angeles radar stations, there's a good chance Lookout Mountain was involved to some degree in the Battle of Los Angeles. Cool, right? Now, later, Lookout Mountain turned into a CIA research and development house, as well as a film studio for the U.S. Air Force to process raw film stock from early bomb tests and nuclear bomb tests. Everything the studio needed to make a motion picture was in-house at Lookout Mountain. There was absolutely no need to go to a public motion picture studio. Now, keep in mind, this place, Lookout Mountain, wasn't even acknowledged until the 1990s even though estimates say that some 19,000 government propaganda movies were made at Lookout Mountain. 
Really? Yes. Stars like Marilyn Monroe, Walt Disney, John Wayne, Ronald Reagan, Bing Crosby, and Jimmy Stewart all had passes to work at the Lookout Mountain Film Studio. And interestingly, none of these actors or actresses, not a one, ever spoke about what they did there. These megastars were needed to help with nuclear film tests? Fuck out of here. No way. Some even claim Lookout Mountain is where B-roll for the faked moon landing was filmed. And I'll leave a, a, a link to a cool period video about Lookout Mountain, the facility itself, in the episode show notes. It's really, really cool. Now, Laurel Canyon even had its own talent company called Lookout Management formed by Elliot Rabinowitz and David Geffen. Lookout, Mountain, uh, Man Lookout Management helped the careers of Neil Young, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Bob Dylan, the Eagles, Buffalo Springfield, and America, just to name a few of the bands. Now, I'm going to feel, feel some conspiracy theory here, but Lookout Mountain was right smack in the middle of Laurel Canyon, which is where the hippie movement uh, almost spontaneously spawned. There was a quote-unquote talent management company called Lookout Management, which helped build the careers of very influential bands of that time. And the rumors go way back before this hippie thing about the CIA and MK Ultra infiltr infiltrating the entertainment industry. Remember, again, MK Ultra was a real CIA program that ran all during the Laurel Canyon music scene and the hippie movement, specifically MK Ultra. 1953 to 1973, and the Laurel Canyon hippie movement, the early 1960s, until the Vietnam War ended in 1975. And of course, the CIA and MK Ultra were supposedly deeply entrenched at Lookout Mountain. Now, humor me here. Could some of the famous bands and actors and actresses we've been talking about, people that influenced how an entire generation thought and behaved, could those influencers will call them could they have been part of the mk ultra program either willingly or unwillingly in other words could they have been created and as a result did the u.s government create and define an entire generation according to their wills and needs <coughs> sorry for that tangent now a few more points about lookout mountain it remained in operation until 1969 then lookout mountain became community housing for a while, then it turned into a celebrity rehab facility, where for about 50 grand a month, stars could get clean. Then most recently in 2015, Jared Leto, 30 Seconds to Mars front man, and the guy who played the Joker in Suicide Squad, he bought Lookout Mountain facility to a tune of a cool $5 million to use as a private residence. Huh. I wonder, I wonder if there's anything underneath or around that area, right? Yeah, I don't no? know. It's, it's really hard to find information on it. Yeah. Really interesting, man. This shit is really interesting. And I'll tell you what, the death list, either by murder or supposed suicide or tragic, air quote, accidents of famous people living in Laurel Canyon and their associates outside Laurel Canyon is just fucking staggering. It, it's, the list is a mile long. And then there's the cult activity. And child pornography rings, all in Laurel Canyon. We could do a, a three-part episode on this thing alone. Yeah. So the question is, were these Laurel Canyon people groomed? Was the whole hippie movement and the anti-war movement and the associated bands created? Were they created? Remember, hippies were not the inventors of the anti-war movement. The anti-war movement began on college campuses by clean-cut conservative, educated, collegiate people, professors and their students, people that, for a lack of a better phrase, could be taken seriously by larger America. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the collegiate anti-war demonstrators, the believable ones, were replaced with the long-haired, bearded, freaky-dressing, free-sexting, LSD-taking, pot-smoking hippies. How does mainstream America take that seriously? Members of the original anti-war movement, these guys, they openly questioned to the media. They said, is this movement manufactured? And this is a quote. Is this movement manufactured? Where the hell are all the hippies coming from? End quote. So the conspiracy is 
the entire hippie anti-war movement was created by the U.S. government, namely the intelligence community, which all these Little Canyon people have in their histories, to put a much less convincing space, put a, to put a much less convincing face onto and subvert the real anti-war movement, the well-dressed, well-educated anti-war movement, to discredit the real movement. Remember, war is fantastic for business. War brings in a shit ton of money for very powerful people. So think about this. If the hippies and the anti-war counterculture, this goes right back to your point at the top of the show, Oscar. If the hippies and the anti-war counterculture were really a thorn in the side of the government, two movements that had a big influence on public opinion, forces that were openly doing and selling drugs, banging underage girls, having sex wherever they pleased, all while changing the way a generation thought, why wasn't anyone ever arrested with more than a slap on the wrist? There were serious charges going on every single day, yet none of them were arrested without a slap on the wrist, with just a slap on the wrist. The draft at the time was in full swing, and most of these Laurel Canyon guys were draft age. Why weren't any of them ever drafted? It's almost like they were allowed to continue. I mean, just before all this, polite America hated Elvis Presley for his, quote, vulgarity, his animalism, end quote, and his seductive, swinging, yummy hips. Elvis was too much for America. The people we're talking about, they're Elvis on crack. Yet they were allowed to continue with little to no interference from law enforcement. It's curious. And it's hard to chalk this up to kids rebelling against mommy and daddy because not a single one of them, no one, not one whose family was involved in intelligence or atomics weapons testing or high up in the army or in the air force or in the navy or dealt in chemical warfare or held government positions or had tons of money. None of these flower children, the ones outraged over the Vietnam War, the draft, the dark roads they thought America was heading down, not one of them ever went on record saying, Daddy, I hate what you're doing. Daddy, what you're doing is wrong. I reject my family because of what they're involved in. Nothing like that did a single one of them ever utter. The end. I see what you did there at the end. I would say... Wait, is this the really the end? It's the end. I'm done. Are we still recording? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. I didn't know if that's what you wanted, like the ending of the actual <laughs> no, show to no. be. No way, dude. I want you to do that. Opinion. I want you to talk. Because you do that. You've you do that so, all the time. You've been so polite and letting me go on and on. I want to hear from well, you, man. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, should we take it's, a could we, could we take a vape break without going to break? Just real quick? Yeah, sure. We both vape. Hey, vape. Who's vape? I should just leave this in there. Oh, that's sweet breathing. <laughs> the listeners are hearing this right now. I love it. Yep. <coughs> so what do you think? I, I really think, I think there's something to this. I really do. It's all too coincidental. There's too much, too much. In the background of these people's family, uh, the family background, too much. That is not so a coincidence. I, I have a few comparisons for you. Um, yes. I saw a movie recently that I love so much that I've been watching. I've seen it like I don't know ten times. Right? It's uh, it's a movie from the nineties called uh, JFK. JFK. Um, which, back into right. the left. Back into the left. Right. Right. I don't know if you what you think of that movie. Uh-huh. Um, I, I love it. It's a it's a marvel of editing. A, any future editors out there. That is your that is your manual. Uh, anyway, um, I don't know if you know this about it, but um, a lot of that stuff in that movie is pretty fake. But it like a lot of it lies, flat out lies that Oliver Stone did on purpose to elicit a response from the general public. Right? He's manipulating the the things and weaving conspiracies that aren't true to tell a story. Right? Okay. Um, I know that he's known to be like very anti-establishment and anti-war. I mean, he was in Vietnam War. That's why he made Platoon, things like that. Um, 
And the connection I'm seeing here is that uh, some of the stuff in that thing relates very closely to what you're talking about, except that in his end, he fabricated something that very is conspiratorial that happened to be coincidental. And that is really the, the, the deaths of a lot of people that either were witnesses or knew the people that knew the people that knew Harvey Oswald, for example, right? All okay. the mysterious deaths of all these people. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, um, what was the guy's name? Uh, Kevin Costner's character, I forget his name. Um, uh, um, it's like, uh, it's, ah, it's gone. 2 a.m., I can't think, I should know this, because I love the Kennedy conspiracy, but. Go ahead. Oh, I love it too. I love yeah. it too. Even if it's wrong, I love it. Um, anyway, um, one of the things he does is that he starts the investigation three years after the murder, after that day, and then he, a lot of his investigation happens even a year or two after that. So, and a lot of those murders and things that people have disappeared or traveled off to is just people moving on or just dying from life happening, and right. not all of them. Some of them could be conspiratorial, it could be shady, but not all of them. But the film shapes it to be. Uh, in order to support its conspiratorial tone, shapes it to be a a big conspiracy. So that way he won't see the evidence, he won't find statements, he won't get eyewitnesses. Um, okay. So a lot of that, I think a lot of it can be applied to some of this. I think it is very much possible that people, that these kids, kids, these hippies, whatever, um, would exactly do that rebellion thing. I'm not saying like to be a rebel like on purpose. Some of them Probably for sure were like that. Some of them do it very blatantly. But I think a lot of them just do it like as a systemic, you know, kid to parent thing. They just do it out of sheer of subconscious will to rebel against their parents. And I think that um, a lot of them were probably just too afraid, let's say, to fucking say anything. Or like, or maybe we're told very explicitly not to. And maybe, you know, I don't know. I mean, my point is, is that I don't know if it's all of them. I could do that, but I think some of them for sure were told and probably knew to some extent that it maybe was somewhat fabricated. I think what it was is that they were they were pushed to it. It's like it's like they weren't told do this or they didn't say like this was going to happen. They didn't know what kind of hair, what kind of tie dye, what kind of anything. They didn't know any of that. I think what they knew is that they knew something would come from this, and they knew that probably what you just said earlier that as a general tone, the public will not take them seriously. And that's the main thing. As long as they don't take them seriously, who cares how big it gets and how how specific they're going to be? They probably just let them do it. Don't arrest them. Let them keep doing their hippie thing. Let them blow up. So we can continue you know? doing our thing in the background. Right. I mm. think, yeah. So I don't think they had any, like, big hand in the, in the development of this shit. I just think they just let it happen. Wow. And I think the more extreme... The more extreme you find these kids, uh, parental guidance, whatever, like the fact that they're all military crazy, you know, office of operational, whatever you said, yeah. like, uh, <laughs> um, I think the more extreme you come from that, like a person who growing up in a cult is probably going to have a more extreme opposite viewpoint than is someone who just grew up in a, uh, in a regular orthodox. Right. And it's, um, so I think the fact that these guys became hippies is probably a very natural version of their extreme military background um you know it's like the more the more headstrong you are the more the reaction to your kids will be based on that right people who get abused all the time react a lot more extremely sometimes in the opposite end sometimes in the very extreme violent end but they react extremely none of them react normally now there are a few odd apples of course but like overall that's the overallness of people's upbringing and what how much upbringing relates to your life and your future and what you will become and what you will do and how you react to things. Usually, that's why a lot of people are boring as shit because none of them come from this kind of thing anymore. <laughs> and uh, many people are like that. And there are more millions out there that are more uh, more traditional, more like their upbringing is much more regular. You know, it has to do with little moments and it is a big life change. So I think the fact that this movement brought on by a lot of fucking, I mean, especially World War II, Vietnam, they combine those two kind of mindsets their parents must have been, of course, extreme military people, of course. And, of course, that their kids will react this way. Hmm. Um, to, great, to, I like that, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, that seems to be the most fitting answer. But it's still, it's still uh, what, I like, what I like about my answer is that it, um, it, it, it takes a sum off the top, but it doesn't diminish the fact that I think you're right, though. I think it was they did allow it to be shaped this way. Or maybe they, they just rounded off the corner. See, so like, here, 
you're going to trust this hippie now? I got I like that. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, Very believable. Good. Well said. Um, I, I love it. I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, and it's also like it takes a lot of power away from the whole movement in a way, you know, not in a, maybe not in a bad way. Like, I don't know. I, I just can't. I wish I was. I wish I was around back then, just so I can know the feel and like think about this now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, could you imagine I, I don't, running through Laurel Canyon naked, <laughs> high as fuck? <laughs> right, and reading, reading that stuff, and. um you know, you think of, uh, where's that, um, have you seen that docu-series on Netflix called, uh, uh, Wild Wild Country? No. No? Um, you should check it out. It's pretty cool. It's, it's not at all what you're talking about, but it is somewhat. It takes place, uh, around that time, a little, a little after, I believe. And, uh, this small town in, uh, I believe in Washington State. I'm not sure where. Um, these, uh, Indian or Hindu based, religion grew up from there like seemingly out of nowhere they bought all this land they basically made their own town there and um they're all wearing a certain they were all wear they, they would all wear red they were very sex positive like extra sex positive mm -hmm. and they did all this stuff and at some point when they had backlash from the the normal people quote unquote right the the ranchers of the side the state department things like that um when they got um when they were like hated by them and started getting resistance from them, they doubled down and they bought guns and they were like poisoning people and shit. That was like, it's like this big thing. And, um, the, the docuseries is kind of, it's a little biased for sure, but it shows a lot of comprehensive viewpoints. It's like, it's almost like this entire thing rolled into one place. Um, in a one in doing one time frame. you can see a lot of similarities to what you were saying about the hippie movement and the mentality of, how they attracted all these white people to go to this Hindu guy who was this religious guy to them. But was it a cult? Was it just a freedom of expression? You know, to them, it's one or the other, you know, and it's, um, it's very interesting what was manipulated there and what wasn't. Huh. And huh. yeah, it's kind of cool. I can see how it could relate. Yeah, definitely. Not a hundred percent, but like some of the stuff totally rings true. Yeah, yeah, it was a it's a fun fun series, very impel very compelling. Cool, I'll check it out. I got yeah. a lot to binge on Netflix. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, any uh, other... what, what do you think? Do you think? Do you, have you thought of anything else or like anything specific that what appealed to you? Number one to make this a topic. Well, you know, I I grew up on music like this thanks to my mom. You know, yeah, uh, the Doors, obviously the beat, even though not. Low Canyon, but the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd, all this stuff, you know, the mamas and the papas and um, yeah. yeah, your like mom was that. a hippie, right? Right, right. She was a flower child. And yeah, totally. so I gravitate towards this music now that I'm older. When I was younger, I fucking hated it. But, uh -huh. you know, now I can't get enough of it. I love it because it reminds me of my childhood and home and my mom. And you know, it's it's, and it's it's just great. It's nostalgic. Ha nostalgic. It's, it's good music, happy music, fun music, even though it's. A lot of it's protesting the war. You still get a good feel listening to it. And um, so that's what, what kind of drew me to it. And then Brian, uh, who helped me put this together, Bubba Maney, yeah. I call him. Bubba told me about this topic, how all these – I think we were talking about music one time when I was on one of my road trips. You know, I'll talk to him for like five hours when I'm on a road trip. And we started talking about conspiracy theories, as we often do, and – started talking about music somehow and he's like well did you hear the laurel canyon stuff i'm like oh we were talking about charles manson and that's what it was because i was yeah thinking about putting together a topic a, a podcast on charles manson and he knows quite a bit about it and he's like well did, did you ever hear of charles manson's title laurel canyon i'm like what the fuck is laurel canyon and he's like you don't know about laurel canyon and it just kind of spinning off and we talked forever about it so i finally sat down over the past i don't know maybe month and a half and started researching this episode and I was immediately drawn in. And to me, to have so many people with so many background similarities, these deep, deep military ties and MK Ultra and intelligence and chemical warfare, and to have so many of these people congregate into such a small area in a in a place that wasn't known for music back in the day, to me right there is suspect that is weird yeah. as fuck that's yeah. that's like you know me walking out of my 
front door and all of a sudden overnight you're next door and Minister Sal's across the street and Brian Bubba Maney, who helped with this episode, is on the other side of my house. It's, it just doesn't hit. It's impossible to have. It'll never happen. To me, that's the same thing with Laurel Canyon. Frank Zappa walks out and, oh, there's Jim Morrison. There's the fucking guy from America. There's the guy from fucking Mamas and the Papas and the Birds and the Monkeys. And, oh, Charles yeah. Manson. It, too much in one, too much concentrated in one area. Yeah. Maybe Does, it didn't even feel that way to them. Can you imagine? Like, they're just neighbors. They don't think oh, about well, it that right, way. Right, right. right. It's right. amazing. Yeah. But but it's still the fact that that's a star, that's a star, that's a star. That Well, I should say that's a budding star, that's a budding star, that's a budding star, that's a budding star, right. I'm a budding star. Too coincidental, man. So I, I really do think there's something here, whether it was their parents training these kids from a very young age with MK Ultra tactics. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but it's it's too curious to be overlooked. I have uh, two questions before I forget that. I didn't write it down. I'm thinking sure. over them now. One is, um, this is a big one. This might be weird. It might be an actual conversation. Uh, what do you think are the, the next, okay, so maybe I should, uh, hold on. rephrase, rewind. Okay. okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> go. Right. I was going to do the noise, but I didn't want to. <laughs> um, do you think if, if the government, or by the government, I mean the institution that allowed this to happen, or let's say for the sake of it, they did do it on purpose. Do you think they succeeded if it was done on purpose? Do you think they succeeded in what they tried to do? Well, the Vietnam raged on regardless of what the, the hippies said. Right. You know, they didn't take... They so didn't, for the sake of argument, would you say it did, it did work? It did do the... The mission worked for them. It was a success. That's, I think it do. I think it did because if if it was the the collegiate, we'll call it movement, that uh-huh. grew to be such a massive force. If it was that crowd, I think change could have happened. I think change could have happened. Um, but since okay. it was the other group that grew to be so large and influential, America was like, get fucked, you know. And and the war was, and people were. I gotta be careful how I say this, you know. Um, yeah. And maybe I don't. I don't know how to say it without. Um, well, just say it with a preface. Like I don't mean this, but you know. Or yeah, whatever. it's almost like America was for the war. I, oh, probably, I mean, yeah, I mean, probably enraged so, people right there. But I think no, I don't think that's a wrong thing to say. Some people were. A lot of people were. Probably, right, yeah. more were because of the, you know, you know, you know. No, you're right. You, you know how many people? Okay, the last, the the last great war before Vietnam was World War Two, which has a lot of. We we're experiencing, I think, a lot of the downwind, the downfall, and the the cons of what we were able to successfully do in World War Two. All the pros have gone and passed now. And that is uh, the fact that we won. You know, we stopped this horrible thing. Then we doubled down on communism, which led to a lot of problems. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Point is, is that I think the next great war was Vietnam. And yeah. I think the you think of the mentality of coming from that high. It's like wanting the sequel to The Godfather, and you know, expecting Godfather Two, but we really got Godfather Three or some other worse or whatever. You know, think of another example. And I think we wanted the sequel to be the same. Or feel as important, and it wasn't. It was a, it was a trashy thing we did, and I, 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 of course, a lot of people were patriotic as fuck. Yeah, and of course, it, you know, I, it, you made me you, you made me think of something. I, I want to strike my answer from the record. Okay, I want to strike my answer from the record. Let I, me talk I, to let me talk I, to our our our, um, our stenographer. Stenographer, can you, yeah. Can you take it? Okay, good. She said okay. Now, you asked me, do I think? If it was a conspiracy, did the conspiracy work? Mm-hmm. Um, if what it, if what the conspiracy was for is to get America behind the war, no, it failed. And here's why. With World War II, like you said, patriotism was at an all-time high. Those mm-hmm. guys, God bless them, when they came home, there were parades in the streets, right? Mm-hmm. They never people, had to pay a drink for the rest of their lives. Right. People loved them. You know, I mean, it was, they were heroes. Veterans of the Vietnam War came home and they got spit on. They got shit on. So it seems like 
America wasn't behind the war. So in that fact, I would say that maybe that conspiracy failed. I don't know. That's tough. It's tough. Well, the reason I ask is that was a preface to my actual question, which is what are, if they did succeed, let's just go with they did it on purpose and they succeeded. What is the, what is the ramifications we're experiencing now? I think you think of, you think of serial killers. You think of, uh, violence in the news. Or just just one aspect. I'm, I'm sure people could think of many better examples that I'm thinking of right now. But I think of what California means to a lot of people. I think it changed so much because of this hippie movement. Uh, you think of um, you know what what happened. Uh, I think I think it did a lot to desensitize a lot of people for the future generations. Uh, all this hippie stuff and the Manson murders. You know, it wasn't a big deal. All this stuff that became huge problems and are still problems today, the way we look at, I don't know, crime or the way we look at, I don't know, it just feels like it's a public, it's like they made crime famous, you know, Mm. like all this, the Manson family coupled with the hippie stuff, like the fact that there were hippies that were anti-war, and if you're like a regular person back then who was over the age of 18, you probably were like, well, these hippies don't know what they're talking about. We were supposed to support our right. government. And then they see something like the Manson thing happen, and then this, uh, you know, Roman Polanski and all these murders and all this uh, chaos from them. They're like, oh, you know, they relate to that. How much, how much does that do for the public view? How much does that do damage for a lot of people thinking of, of their child growing up uh, with any sort of, I don't know, rebellious bone in their body? You know, you think of, people who become metalheads a decade later, right? Yeah. And you think of, uh, you know, and you think of how that relates to Satanism and how it relates to the Memphis Three and shit, and they didn't really do it, you know, it just, just because they look like they did it or something like that, you know? Mm. Um, I don't know. It feels like a big, giant, like, like a stepping stone to this, like, cynical, I don't know. I don't know if I'm really saying it right, but it just feels like it's, it's like a part of a, I think there were negative effects that they never foresaw coming. Yeah, it's possible. And, you know, the, for sure, the, in 1969 with the Manson murders, those, you know, that said that killed America's innocence right there. That ended the, the summer of love that, that killed the kind of the peace, love, hippie movement. And, and right. America saw a new, a new side of itself. With, with and you Manson. think of the, the murder, right? The murders of JFK and uh, Robert Kennedy, right? Bobby Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Um, how you said earlier that academic people were in charge of these anti-war stuff. They were doing this stuff. They were doing it smart. They were going to college and doing it. Right. They were being political and doing it. And they have two figures to them. Their, their Jim Morrison, their fucking Dennis Hoppers get killed in front of them for running and for public office for it. Their, their champions got killed. And how do you not get depressed from that? You know, it's like, yeah. it's like that was maybe strike one and then strike two is a hippie movement. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like first huh. you destroy the champions, then you discredit their movement by adding these hippies in there. This is assuming that they did it on purpose, of course. Right. right. But like, oh, that's I'm, I'm loving this. Yeah. yeah. It's like a giant, like a step one, step two, like a phase one. Right. And uh, phase one is destroy the, the people, the higher ups, which is the president in this case, and then his brother. Um, and then the step two is discredit them all and make people forget what they were running for huh. you know make people like they were saying all this hippie stuff just not with music and long hair they were just doing it with shorter hair <laughs> yeah shorter hair and suits suits right and a lot of fucking i'm sure but still that's a that's a really interesting point i don't have the answers to all this of course but right. I wonder what the, the the big picture was then. You know, take out the figurehead, then discredit the entire movement. What were they trying to do in the background? That's what I'm dying to know. Right. It's, but we'll never know. You know. Yeah, obviously, it's something we can we can't ever know. And even if they people will tell us straight to our face, how do we believe them? How do we believe any of that? I mean, right. it's just um, it's insane. It's fun to think about, but it's like it, it would make sense because you can't. It's not, it's not just, you can't just cut off the head. You know, another one will grow back if you don't discredit its existence, you know? Good point. It's like the Komodo dragon or something, you know? Great point. <clears throat> um, I had another question earlier, but I forgot. You sure? I don't know, maybe I'll jog, I don't know. 
<laughs> it's gone. Well, I hope I hope the listeners like this episode. I, I put a, you know put a lot of research into this along with with Brian and. Um, I, I would say, though, I think we're coming out of that stint. I think we're coming out of that fog a little bit because a lot of more people are into, you know, the more cynical version of them. People are like, just, you know, do you do you behind closed doors, but don't bother me. That's a oh, more yeah. cynical version of it. That's but also, I am. Right. I know that's the way you are. And in many ways, that's how I am, but not 100 percent. But I also don't have a family like you do, so I don't have like a lot to lose. Um, Understood. However, the more positive side of that, you see a lot of this in people I talk to here and there or myself to an extent, is that uh, a lot of people are like, you know, I may not be in your religion. I may not be in your viewpoint. I may not uh, like your fashion sense, but that don't mean nothing because you are like it's like a fellow man thing. It's like people are becoming more cool about what you're doing as long as you're not forcing it on others. Right. And um now, we get extremism everywhere, of course. I'm not saying that. Sure. But I'm saying I think people are more relaxed about judging people, e- even if they're, they're wearing different things than you are or hear, listening to things that are different than you are. My friends are all a, comp- a compilation of people that watch completely different things, listen to completely different things, dress completely differently. You know, it's, uh, it's just much more okay with that. Hmm. I don't think it was so much back then. Back then, it was really much more black and white about that kind of thing. At yeah. least it felt that way. Like what the, yeah. when they were ready to crucify Elvis for his swinging hips. Right. You know, I mean, it's... Back, right. Back then, you can identify who you hated by their bell bottoms. You can't do that now. A guy wearing bell bottoms could be a pedophile or it could be the nicest guy on the planet. It doesn't. You have to meet him. You don't know that. It's true. I mean, look people, at me. If people see yeah. me walking down the street. They probably think I'm homeless, but... You know, from nine to five, I'm wearing a, a nice suit and tie. You know, huh? Well, I mean, I don't know about nice, but <laughs> I'm kidding. But no, it's true. You're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, nowadays it's not just your. I'm not saying education has no part in it. Of course, it has a big part. But not. It's not just education that people value when you talk to you. It's like other things too. Like, what are you into? What do you think about this? You know, it's not just that. You know, people are more fascinated. They're asking more questions. Things that they don't know. I don't know. I see it more often, maybe. And uh, maybe maybe it's not true. Maybe I'm just, like, seeing more positive things than I should be. But uh, it feels that way, you know? I mean, being optimistic, that's good. I think that's what we need today. More optimism. Yeah, for sure. You know? And uh, I hope that's the case. I hope we are coming out of this fog generation, you know, generationally slow, but getting there, maybe. And uh, I don't know. Maybe, it'll, maybe, maybe we'll go back to the day that, what, our great-grandfathers used to talk about, how... The man's work is what is what should is what should you know get you progress in life, not who you are, not where you came from, not how much money who you have. You know. but like, yeah, right, or who you know. Um, but yeah, I don't know. No, it's good stuff, man. Yeah, glad this made you think. That was awesome. Oh, your st- dude, your topics always make me think. It's great. I never never would have thought of this like this in a million years if we didn't talk about it. <laughs> awesome. Very good. Yeah. Well, what do you say we uh, we bring it to a close? Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. Let's see if we can edit the Skype call because I've never done this before. Yeah, I'm nervous how it came out. I hope it comes out well. Yeah, uh, I hope my vaping wasn't too interrupted. No, no. Um, <laughs> listeners, love you guys. Support the show. Visit our Patreon. Hit us up on social media. Um, Oscar, say good night. Uh, good night. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Good night, Mike. How do you say that? Good night. Good night, bitches. Good night. Good night. Good night. Ask her to take us home. All right. Should we should we start and kind of get it just just roll? Fuck it, let's do it. Fuck it. Okay, I love it. All right, five, four, three, two. <laughs> Welcome. To Wait, the- I'm supposed to give the countdown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Just uh, go ahead. Whatever okay. you want. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Let me take a sip of water.
Okay. Oh, and a vape. Oh my god, do I sound that loud when I vape? Yeah, I can hear when you're vaping. Damn. Okay. <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to do something about that. Okay. Okay, ready? Yes. Five, four, three, two. Okay, so now it's break time, obviously. Uh-huh. Everything's still recording. This is fun. Oh, you you want to? Sorry, what? No, no, say this is fun. I can't. This is this is pretty cool. I like this. Now it won't be, at least for you and I, it's not going to be so stressful all the time, where we could always kind of do something like this in a pinch. Yeah, I also don't want to be lazy though, and and like get used to this. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I know that it's, I know, I mean, maybe I shouldn't be so against that. Um, I just don't want to, like, blink, and it's been six months, and we've only done it this way. You know? Yeah. And then, um, but yeah, uh, so, here, uh, pay attention to see if you can hear this, how bad you hear the vaping right now. Okay. Hold on, I'm going to try something. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, it was loud and clear. Damn it. <laughs> how, about, how about mine? Let, let me try this. Hold on. I'm going to try okay. to... Where's the microphone? What if I... Okay, what if I did this? <laughs> Dude, I literally had my fist over the microphone on my headset. <laughs> I did nothing. <laughs> it just sounded like an angry vape. Oh, my God. <laughs> Okay, so I won't be vaping. <coughs> I'm sorry, I did a few times. I'm I just do it so compulsively. I don't even. Oh, preaching you know? to the choir, man. It's so compulsive. I mean, I think people will forgive us, but uh, yeah, it's not great. Uh, I will try not to. Okay, but yours isn't. It's not horrible. It's not horrible, but <laughs> you could. It sounds like you're dragging something like across oh, yeah. a, like, like across a, a cat. Wood. Yeah, kind of. Like a, something across a wood floor is what it reminds me of. I thought of that before. Taking a hit of a, of a, mate, of a mod or a vape setting is uh, feels like a, dragging a cat through the woods. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a good commercial. <laughs> yeah, they should focus on that. I've never seen a vape commercial in my life. I don't I, know if they exist. I don't think so. 